Today we've got a great revenge story on a horrendous boss. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, we can't have coffee? You can't have coffee. In my last place of work, when I was looking to hire someone from my department, I would offer cold drinks and coffee at the interview in order to make them feel welcome. We could take the cold drinks out of the storage, but we had to order coffee from the kitchen and someone from the kitchen team would bring it out. One day, they called me back and said they couldn't bring me coffee since the CEO had decided coffee would only be provided for whole day events. Urgh, that cheapskate. Since then, I provided my own coffee for interviewees because, to me, the welcoming impression was more important than the, like, 30 cents a cup of coffee costs. But I plotted my little revenge since I'd been asked to do a workshop for the other department heads and the CEO also wanted to participate. He for some reason loved workshops. Well, why not? So the day of the workshop came. I prepped the room. The participants trickled in and got settled, including the CEO. I greeted the group and laid out the plan for the next few hours, asked if there were any questions. The CEO asked, can we maybe call the kitchen and ask where the coffee is? They seem to be running late. I made a point of taking a sip from my travel mug and then answered that there would be no coffee because this was a half day workshop and our new rule said that coffee would only be provided for whole day events. I still cherish the surly look he gave me in response. He didn't say anything and instead opened a bottle of water. Hey, I'm a person that does really quite enjoy some coffee, but hey, you got a healthier option, right? Just hope you can keep your eyes open. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of revenge, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is, sometimes the best revenge is no revenge. This happened over 35 years ago. I was a lifeguard slash counselor at a Boy Scout summer camp. For whatever the reason, all us lifeguards were labeled as the troublemakers of the camp, especially when it came to playing pranks, which we called midnight maintenance. One of the guys who worked in the kitchen was a good guy, very hardworking, but he was autistic. Some of the other kitchen staff used to dump on him and give him a real hard time. The very last night of the camp, we called the kitchen on the camp phone and told them they were getting payback for abusing the hard worker all summer. We didn't do anything to them, we just hid in the woods by their campsite laughing our butts off, watching them set up booby traps that backfired and watching them freak out every time they heard something moving in the brush. They were up all night waiting for the moment that never came. The next morning they were running off their mouths saying we're all talk no action. Then we told them how we pranked them by not pranking them and how lame their booby traps were. This is completely irrelevant to the story, but I learned the other day that booby trap backwards is party boob. That's literally the only thing I could think about while reading this story, it's so dumb. I do like the idea though of keeping them up all night preparing for some big thing that never came. Didn't even get any sleep. Our next story is, alright, if my groceries go on the belt, then they go on the belt. I am a big Costco fan. So much of the stuff in my house is from Costco that my family doesn't even bother asking. My membership is old enough to get a driver's license now. Being that I've been doing this for years, I have a couple tricks to get through faster, such as not going when old people are usually there, and especially not when they're giving away free snacks and old people are there. Another trick is at the checkout, I have all the stuff in my cart with the barcodes easily scannable. If I don't have too much stuff, the employee doesn't even have to grab anything but their scan gun, which is nice because Costco stuff is big and heavy. Well, one day I'm in line to check out and I can see the cashier is not having a good day. But whatever, I'm not a difficult customer to work with. Should be fine. As I get up, she suddenly tells me all my stuff needs to be out of my cart and on the belt. Conversation went fairly quick. All items on the belt, please. Hey, my stuff is ready to scan and I don't need it boxed up. I'm set to go. Sir, all stuff belongs on the belt. Thanks. I say just scan it, please. Thanks. On the belt now, please. Thanks. At that point, even the guy helping her scan can see she's being rude and goes to step in. I ignore him and respond to her. Hey, I have a back injury from my time in the military. Please assist me in putting my items on the belt. She stares at me pissed for a second. Finally, she grabs her gun and starts scanning. I thought you said it had to go on the belt, ma'am. What's going on? She finished scanning the items and checked me out without another word. The guy helping apologized and offered to load my car. 
I thanked him for being polite and professional and left. This was years ago, and I've never been asked to do it again. Usually the employee thanks me for setting it up so they don't have to lift any Costco-sized packages. Yeah, I mean, what's the point of the scan gun if everything has to be on the conveyor belt? If it's efficient and easy enough, who cares? This person was being a needless stickler. Our next story is, I participated in a cold call. I was called by Best Buy, offering me some phone plan or another, had a long-term scam written all over it. The man asked about my phone and phone plan and whatnot, and I participated. He proceeded to offer me a worse plan. I compared his plan to mine in response, like very calmly just pointed out the difference. He then asked if I could transfer me to his sales manager, which I said he could. She explained to me the plan again. I again pointed out the differences in the plans. She said, so you're not interested in this? I replied I was not. She then asked what I wanted. I said, nothing. You called me. And she hung up. I know they're already working a terrible job that doesn't pay them enough. I promise I didn't do anything worse than waste their time, like they did mine. I mean, it's not the worst thing that could have happened. You could have entertained the, we're calling you about your car's extended warranty. Then I think it's more than justifiable to waste their time, if you even get a human on the line. This next story is, school bus revenge. I'm a few years older than my brother, and we took the bus together in elementary school. One day I looked up and noticed some of the cool girls in the back of the bus throwing spitballs at my brother's head for literally no reason. The next day I got on the bus with a regular bag of M&Ms and sat in the back. They sat down in the front. As soon as the bus started rolling, I began throwing M&Ms at them five to six at a time, beaning them with hard candy. When they would turn around to see who was throwing them, I stared out the window like the quiet little mouse I was. I emptied the bag on them. I remember feeling very satisfied. I'm still happy about it. It's pretty good, but like, it's such a waste of M&Ms. And also, I feel terrible for the bus driver that has to clean that up after that. I remember in middle school, there was a kid who had a box of staples. And he kept chucking them at people with long hair. And so it would like get all caught up in their hair. But you probably wouldn't have enough momentum from the back of the bus with just a staple. This next story is really petty. My next door neighbor when I was a young teen was the same age as my little sister. She danced in competitions and did some modeling for catalogs. Nothing very special, but she bragged non-stop. When she wasn't bragging, her parents were doing it for her. She wasn't the nicest to my sister, and while me and sis weren't exactly tight, she is my sister. So I was walking to school one day and caught up and passed her and our gaggle of her girlfriends. They would have been in grade 7 or 8. I was in high school. As I went past, I said hi and kept going. She said something she and her girlfriends thought was hysterical. I can't remember what it was for the life of me. Let it go or smack her down? Stupid question. I decided to hit her where it would hurt. Hey Fiona, are you pregnant? Or did you just get fat? I then turned and held walking, but not before I saw her face turn bright red and the sound of girls howling with laughter as I walked away was music to my ears. Sorry, don't be mean to my little sister. Only the siblings have the right to make fun of and bully their siblings. You bully someone's siblings and it's all fair game. Our next story is, online retailer essentially tells me to bugger off, so I bugger them. This happened about a year ago. When we bought and gutted our house, I had ordered a whole new high-efficiency HVAC system online from a retailer I'd bought from before. Good so far. My local HVAC guy had done the duct work and installed the system. Everything ran fine. When we finally moved in, he noticed the second floor was a bit warm and called our guy. Unfortunately, he decided to retire. So I call another company and they come out to check the system realize that the condenser is too small for our house, as well as the main trunk is too small. They were spaced together by the online retailer. Well, of course, I'm not happy, but swallow it and order a larger condenser from the online retailer while the HVAC guy changes the main trunk. The new unit was supposed to be freighted in after my vacation at the beach. Awesome. Well, awesomeness didn't last long. While on vacation, I get a notification that the unit had been delivered. I thought it was strange because it was three weeks ahead of schedule and my doorbell cam didn't go off. So I open my doorbell cam and I certainly see the unit, 
but the unit is 60 feet away on the street? What the freak? I immediately call the online retailer and tell them that I'm not home, and the delivery company left the unit in the street and I need them to at least get it onto the porch. They didn't care, kept saying, not our problem, we're not the delivery company. They refused to call the delivery company or help in any way. I keep trying to get a supervisor to talk to them about the situation, but the CS rep refused to do it. After 45 minutes on the phone, they just disconnected me. Note, I didn't get all Karen on anyone. At this point I'm panicking because someone is certainly going to see it and it's going to be thrown on the back of a pickup by some thief. Finally I call a friend who leaves work and grabs his father-in-law. They manage to wrangle this monstrosity into the backyard. Disaster averted. At this point though I am seriously pissed. Then I remember I paid for the unit via PayPal. So just to mess with them and be petty, I filed a grievance with PayPal for the $3,700 I paid for the unit. I wholly expected this to go nowhere as the seller would have proof of delivery, etc, etc. It was more just to be petty, not really expecting anything. So now it's almost two weeks later and I get an email that PayPal is refunding my $3,700. I'm incredulous. Apparently PayPal tried to contact them several times with no response, so they just gave it back to me. Woohoo! I did set the money aside in case the online retailer tried to come after me. After 6 months though, they didn't. It's been a year now and not a peep. That money gave my wife and I a very nice weekend getaway. Thanks for the free condenser, OR. Note, since my old one was less than a year old and almost no time on it, my HVAC guy sealed it back to factory, and I sold it on Facebook Marketplace for 1600 bucks. So not only did I get a free upgrade, I made some money. Bonus! Yeah, if the delivery driver literally does not even get it onto your property, they have severely messed up and there's no recourse there, right? Like even if it's just like roadside adjacent to your property, at least they like got it kinda close. This next story is, fire me? Watch me mildly inconvenience you. Necessary background, I'm a 28 year old female working as a semi truck driver. I work for a contractor within a large mail carrier. As part of my job, I have my doubles endorsement, which means I often haul two short trailers rather than one long one. There's a piece of equipment that connects the rear trailer to the front trailer called a trailer dolly. It's essentially a trailer axle, four wheels, and weighs upwards of 2,000 pounds. You can push them by hand, but any kind of hill makes it really difficult without hooking up to equipment first. I had some scheduling conflicts with my last job due to childcare issues, and had worked out a resolution that included taking weekend shifts for the guys that wanted those weekend days off anyway. My boss fired me the night before my first shift off, and waited until the end of the day to tell me that. He also insisted that I would need him for a reference for a future job if I wanted any chance at being rehired. However, I called some other contractors and was in a truck within two days. I happily waved at my old boss when I saw him. It was fantastic. My new job is great by the way. Here's where the petty revenge comes in. I'm still giggling about it. Something to note with my old company is that they are local city drivers. This means that they only ever haul one trailer at a time so none of their drivers are required to have doubles endorsements, including the boss and his wife. They're also the only company that doesn't park their trucks in the bobtail lot, but actually parks back by where the empty trailers park. Our lot had been under construction lately, and because of that, people have been leaving equipment out everywhere. One day, I have to start my route with an empty trailer and the only ones available happen to be parked back by where my old company parks and I found the nicest one available. The problem was that someone left a dolly right in the way, so I couldn't swing hard enough to not sideswipe a trailer or hit the dolly. I did what I had to do and pushed that dolly a bit uphill 20 feet back so I could just barely swing the corner. That just happened to be directly in front of my old boss's nice Cadillac he had parked for the day for work. He is not legally allowed to touch, lift, or otherwise move one since he doesn't have his endorsement or training. I smiled knowing he would have dropped his last trailer for the day, drove all the way to the back of the lot to park, only to have to turn around and go track down the shop. 
The guys that only move trailers around the yard are also not allowed to move dollies for the same reason. Anyways, maybe I can't really get back at them, but hey, at least I can make the end of his day slightly more annoying. I just want to see that reality where this guy gets fed up, decides to try to move it himself anyways, and messes something up badly. You know, something that really just flips them over and gets them in real trouble. This next story is, woman wasn't expecting that she would get an annoying riding buddy. This takes place in the Czech Republic, where many people are often really grumpy. My girlfriend, 30, and I, male 21, were waiting for a bus ride to go to her hometown for a wedding. As you'd expect, we had three bags and they were packed to the point where zipping the bag required you to sit on it, especially her bag as she was one of the bridesmaids. Before we boarded the bus, we had to wait for the passengers who had paid beforehand to reserve seats. My girlfriend and I had not prepaid. We were in somewhat of a line which allowed for the passengers who reserved seats to pass. The line for unreserved seat passengers was essentially respected, except by this woman. She arrived when the line was somewhat being formed and decided to stand next to us. As our turn to board was coming up, she quickly scooted in front of my girlfriend and looked forward as if she was completely oblivious to the fact that she had done something that was traditionally frowned upon. My girlfriend was obviously quite annoyed and started saying out loud, in English, much of the older generation in this country don't understand English very well, well that's a witchy thing to do, can you believe this woman? I was calm as I'd counted how many people had already boarded the bus, and there was still a good chance we'd find seats together in the unreserved rows, so I didn't think it called for any type of confrontation. Still, I'd calmly responded, let's be honest, we can't be surprised when witches do witchy things. Looking back, it was unnecessary, but I was also tired and the bags were heavy so I was a bit impatient. We finally sit down and my girlfriend chose to sit in the two free seats behind her. I would have chosen the seats in front of her and then just slowly reclined my seat back every few minutes so that she wouldn't have noticed my little act of revenge, but this ended up being better. It's important to note that the row the woman chose was the last row with an overhead shelf for bags. The shelf was a little longer in the front, so every person essentially had space for their bag if they moved their bags a little towards the front of the bus. It's also important to mention that the shelf was essentially empty and I could have placed another 5 bags next to ours if I wanted to. We finally hit the road and the woman is talking on the phone, loudly I might add, saying how she's going to visit her grandson who's so sweet but that he plays metal music in his room and she can't stand the sound of it. After she finishes the call, she takes off her windbreaker and plans to put it above her seat. She finally sees that my bag is directly above her seat and instead of moving her jacket 35 centimeters to the right on the shelf or setting her jacket on the empty seat beside her, she decides to confront me in an entitled tone. Excuse me, young man, but I can't put my jacket anywhere because your fat bag is in the way. I was bored, so I decided to act like this was a tragedy. Oh no, what will we do? Maybe if we put our heads together, we can find a solution. Her face turned from shock to old communist grandma rage. She yelled back, Well, don't you know that the shelf space is for the person directly below the seat? Oh, I'm so sorry. I truly didn't know that was like an unspoken rule. So the space above your seat is only for you and the potential passenger next to you? I say, truly acting sorry and embarrassed. Yes, yes it is, so please move it to your spot, she says, acting victorious. Of course, right away. I quickly get up and take my girlfriend's bag off the shelf and place it on the seat where I was sitting next to her. I keep my bag in the exact same spot and plop myself right next to old woman with a grin. The look on her face was absolutely priceless as she was trying to understand what just happened. I smile at her, take my headphones out and play some death metal way too loud so she can definitely hear it. I might have hearing loss. I don't even like death metal, but it was definitely worth it knowing she was annoyed the whole time. My girlfriend was a bit lonely, I didn't sit next to her for the bus ride but she ultimately agreed it was the best way to get back at her. Just the sheer confidence to sit next to this person that you have obvious, like, hatred for. She's rude enough to just boldly jump right in front of you in line, even, like, bring attention and call out to you. So the confidence to just stand up and scoot right in next to her. I mean, you had the potential of subscribing to a terrible bus ride of getting your ear yapped off. Our next story is, it's safe to say I've got this case locked up tight. A few years ago, I was looking for a gun safe. 
Turns out there's a local craftsman in my area who's building custom safes at a reasonable price. Advertising on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist. John has a bunch of pictures and videos of his builds. Everything from tiny pistol safes to vault doors for walk-in gun rooms. Small business, local guy, what's not to like? I talk to him in person, check out some of his current products, and he walks me through his shop. He seems legit, so we strike a deal for him to build me a nice medium-sized safe. It'll take a few months, he tells me. Then I make a big mistake. I pay three installments over the next three months, and he has all my money up front. Go ahead and tell me in the comments what an idiot I am, I earned it. Over the first few months, John periodically emails me updates with pictures of his progress. It's going a little slower than he'd promised, the safes are a side gig for him, but he's a one-man show, running a small-time operation. I understand that life gets in the way sometimes, and I'm flexible. Spoiler alert, a lot more of his life starts to get in the way. His wife leaves him, he loses his primary employment in town and has to go work in the oil fields, etc, etc. It's one thing after another, so six months in, I gently open the door to a possible refund. But he continues to insist, completion is just around the corner, I just need a little more time. I get it, life is messy and I've been on the receiving end of the crap stick more than once. So I let it go for a few months. John strings me along out to about a year before I give up and just tell him plainly, I want my money back. Sure, I feel bad for him and his changed circumstances, but he's got my money and I still don't have a safe. I'm flexible, right up to the point where I'm not. He tells me he won't refund, so I start finding creative ways to apply pressure. John has stopped responding to my emails, won't answer calls from my number, ignores my texts. He wants to get stupid. My army platoon sergeant used to tell me back in the day, We can get stupid, but I've got a lot more experience at it than you. Remember those Facebook and Craigslist ads I mentioned earlier? Let the fun begin. Every ad he has up gets a mirror image ad from me but with SCAM scrolled across the top and bottom. I grab all his keywords, including his company name, and tuck them into my ads. So anyone searching for him or his products will find my ads too. I do a public record search, checking for any complaints that I should have found before contracting with them. Better Business Bureau, Chamber of Commerce, whatever I can find. There's nothing in the normal places, but I dig up something unexpected and even better. His name and address pops up, and a public proceeding transcript, legal stuff. It's all there in black and white and on the screen. But it's pure gold for me. Turns out a few years back, John was fired from his job at a high-profile public service run by the local government. He got caught sleeping on the job and also got caught lying about completing work he never did. I revised my Facebook and Craigslist scam ads, adding a link to the public proceeding along with a couple of quotes from the transcript that detailed his wrongdoing. Even after all of this, I still can't get my money or my safe. I turn the heat up a little more by paying a visit to small claims court, where I file a claim and get a hearing date. This part isn't really revenge, it's just to legally force him to engage with me. The judge orders us into mediation. John comes in with no documentation other than the sales contract and tries to equivocate about a bunch of things. Not quite lying, but definitely not telling the truth. All throughout, he's pissing and moaning about my John's a scammer ads. Looks like I really got into his head with those. I have all our emails and texts printed out, tabbed and cross-referenced in a folder, and I use that to knock down everything he says. The mediator realizes I have a slam dunk case and asks me what I want. I said I want my safe or I want my money back. The mediator says, John, what can you do to make this right? John says money's tight so I can't give him a refund, but I can finish the safe in about two months. Outside of that, I really need OP to take his ads down, he's killing my business. The mediator says, here's my decision. OP will take down his John's a scammer ads until this is over. John will deliver the safe to OP within 90 days. If John fails to deliver, OP will be awarded triple the amount he paid. John and I both agreed to it. I'm peeved about having to take down my ads, but it looks like this is the only way things will move forward. 90 days come and go. 
In news that will shock absolutely nobody, no safe shows up at my door. I start filling out the paperwork to get my judgment, but can't get time off work to file it at the courthouse. I get an email from John about three weeks later. The safe is done and ready for delivery. Do you still want it? Should I or shouldn't I? After the visit to small claims court, I would talked it over with my wife and a couple of realities became obvious. First, above anything else, I need a gun safe. The safe is arriving late as heck, but better late than never, right? Second, I might be awarded a monetary judgment, but lord knows if I'll ever see the money, repayment could take years. Best just to take the safe if he can deliver as promised and be done with the whole sorry episode. I decide to accept the safe and John gives me a delivery date, which he promptly misses. Twice. Third time's the charm though. John finally makes good and delivers the safe within a few weeks, and strangely, when he arrives, he treats me like it's just business. We're buds and acts like there's no hard feelings. Maybe an old head injury? Who the heck knows? Anyways, as he's installing the safe, he tells me all about how business has dried up for him in the area, and it's like he's completely forgotten my role in that. He then tells me because of the work situation here, he sold his house and he's moving back close to family in another state, leaving real soon. So I get my safe, John's out of business, and he's leaving town. I guess it's a win, but it sure was painful getting there. The safe still works great. He probably left town because his business was utterly ruined in that area at least. Probably wanted to get out of there and try to find a new market where people will actually buy from him. Especially considering they probably have some kind of trackable record after the small claims court, right? This next story is Petty Revenge on Sadistic Boss. So my old boss was a narcissistic demon from heck. I know that sounds melodramatic and that the term narcissist is overused these days but I promise, this time it applies. I also started researching how to interact with narcissists, and almost as soon as I started grey rocking her, she lost interest and went to find another victim. For context, I work in the healthcare field, which is perfect for people like her, because she could constantly use her employees' desire to do right by their patients against them. Her favorite things were to put you on the spot in front of people and to question your dedication, intelligence, or integrity at any given opportunity. A huge pet peeve of hers was if she didn't have all attention on her at all times. There was very much a teacher-student dynamic at play, which obviously didn't sit well with me as a fully grown adult human. I looked at my phone once during a meeting to check the calendar because we were talking about the schedule. When I looked up, Everyone had stopped talking, and she was leaned forward in her seat, eyes wide, staring at me with such a look of disgust on her face, because my eyes drifted from her for five seconds. In trainings, she wouldn't teach us anything about the topic at hand, and would instead talk about herself and her resume for an hour and a half with no regard for anyone else's time or commitments. If you dared to look at the clock during one of these trainings, She would call you out and tell you she wasn't done yet or ask if you had somewhere else to be, etc. And God forbid you yawn during a meeting with her. But she was our director at the time, and we just had to take it. Cut to nearly a year after I started, and she announces that she's taking over a different team and will no longer oversee our department. Cue internal cheering and bottle popping. We had one last meeting with her and our new director to discuss the transition, etc and I was gifted the beautiful opportunity to mess with her just a little. She was seated at one end of a long conference table, and I was at the end on the same side as her with one or two people between us. Toward the beginning of the meeting, I noticed that if I angled myself just right in my chair, she wouldn't be able to see me because a coworker's head blocked her view. Obviously, she notices immediately and scoots back a little in her chair so she can maintain eye contact with me. After some time passes, I move again and she can't see me, so she scoots. So I do it again, and again, until the end of the meeting rolls around and she's basically scooted all the way back against the wall so she can continue to keep an eye on me. I confessed to my coworkers once we were free from her, and they were all confused about why she was acting so weird, and it gave us all a good laugh and also took some of the fear we all had for her away. I left that job a while ago because it was killing my soul, 
but that definitely was one of my proudest moments, even if it was petty. Sometimes petty is all you have, and like Kevin Malone said, it's just nice to win one. I mean, the idea of being in a meeting for probably an hour or more and being uncomfortable and feeling like you always have to scoot around and adjust yourself, that's plenty torture enough. Knowing this person has a constant monologue going on in their head about keeping an eye on OP and having to adjust, play this little scooting game just to keep an eye on them, it was great. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another awesome revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.